Hey everyone, welcome to the online program of Amrita Civil Service Academy. My name is C B Joy. This is part two of decoding the current affairs of daily MCQs of June 2020. So without any delay, we'll go into the video. Question 13. इन कंटेक्स्ट ऑफ प्रधानमंत्री किसान ऊर्जा सुरक्षा एवं उत्तम अभियान महाअभियान पीएम कुसुम स्कीम कंसिडर द फॉलोइंग स्टेटमेंट्स इट इज एन इनिशिएटिव ऑफ मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ न्यू एंड रिन्यूएबल एनर्जी एम एन आर ई इट एम्स टू एड सोलर एंड अदर रिन्यूएबल कैपेसिटी ऑफ ट्वेंटी फाइव मेगा वॉट बाई ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू एंड अंडर द स्कीम फार्मर्स आर असिस्टेड टू इंस्टॉल सोलर पम्प्स एंड ग्रिड कनेक्टेड सोलर एंड अदर रिन्यूएबल पावर प्लांट्स इन द एयरलाइंस चूज द करेक्ट आंसर ऑप्शन ए ओन ओनली ऑप्शन बी टू एंड थ्री ओनली ऑप्शन सी वन एंड थ्री ओनली एंड ऑप्शन डी ऑल ऑफ दी एब So looking at this, Pradhan PM Kusum scheme, it is an initiative of Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. Yes, it is quite possible because it deals with solar energy and solar plants. So it could be the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. So the first statement is correct. You can eliminate option B two and three. Uh, the option uh, B, option B two and three can be eliminated. Uh, and under this scheme, the farmers are asked to install solar pumps and grid connected solar and other renewable power plants in their lands. Yes, the third statement also seems right. So keeping that in mind, one and three is definitely correct. So we are we have option of option C, one and three, and option D, all of the above. The question comes in option two. It statement two. It aims to add solar and other renewable capacity of 25 megawatt by 2022. 25 megawatt all over the country seems to be a very small number, which could be easily large scale. so that seems to be a bit of a you know very very small number compared to what could be done through pm uh, kusum scheme so at the same time it is a bit hard to remember because unless one has a general idea of what is the pm kusum it could be really hard for us to know the, whether it is linked directly to solar and other you know uh, other alternative sources of energy so it is of the utmost necessary that one must generally have a idea of pm kusum to able to be, uh, you know handle this question very effectively but the second statement seems a uh, bit uh, irregular so if you eliminate that you are left with option c 1 and 3 only we'll go for the explanation the answer is c statement 1 and 3 are correct because the mnre has launched the pm kusum scheme for farmers for installation of solar pumps and grid connected solar and other renewable power plants in the country the statement 2 is not correct because the scheme aims to add solar and other renewable capacity of 25750 megawatt it was not 25 megawatt rather it was 25750 megawatt by 2022 with total central financial support of rupees 34422 crore including service charges to the implementing agencies so that is the answer for that that is the explanation just remember it is not 25 megawatt but rather it is 25750 megawatt by 2022 pm kusum deals with uh, assistance to farmers for connecting uh, you know uh, solar power plant solar plants and uh, renewable source of energy for their farm activities so we'll go for the next question question number 14 in context of real time electricity market rtm consider the following statements it will enable consumers discoms and captive users to buy power on exchanges just an hour in advance currently only indian energy exchange iex and power exchange india pxil has commenced real time electricity market on their platforms choose the correct code option a one only option b two only option c both one and two and option d none of the above this is a very difficult question because unless one knows what is the real time uh, electricity market and which are the power exchanges in india it's going to be a bit hard for us to take it after abc type of questions it is the two statement questions like this which are going to be really hard for us to tackle at the same time uh, the first statement seems highly correct so keeping that you can say it's either option a one only or option C both one and two. It's not either option B nor is it option D. So we managed to make it a fifty-fifty elimination. Now the idea is to find the correct answer. Currently, only Indian 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 Energy Exchange (IEX) and Power Exchange India (PXIL) has commenced RTM on their platforms. Yes, it could be that, but again the keyword only is present, so that could be a possibility of uh, you know doubts in your mind. Either way, I would suggest you to go for option C both one and two or option A one only. The correct answer is option C. We'll go for the explanation, and uh, please listen to this explanation so that in the future you will be able to handle such questions. Yeah, if there is any question based on the real-time LNG market, the statement one is correct because the RTM enables consumers, including discoms and captive users, to buy power on exchanges just an hour before delivery. RTM will help consumers purchase electricity just an hour in advance. Statement two is correct because the country's two power exchanges, the IEX. And the PXIL commands real-time electricity market (RTM) on their platforms. That is that for the explanation. We'll go for the next question. Question 15. Consider the following statements about the Kolkata port. This oldest operating port in India was constructed by the British East India Company. It is the only riverine major port in India. 
it is called as the gateway to eastern india select the correct answer using the given below code one only two and three only one and two only option d all of the above so there are multiple things to be discussed at the same time you can definitely say it is the oldest operating port in india it was constructed by british east india company it is the only riverine major port in india what is a riverine it means the port is not located on the sea but rather it's located inside a river you can definitely say that kolkata is the only uh, major riverine port in india it is also called as the gateway to eastern india yes it is quite possible the eastern india it is known as the gateway to eastern india so two and three is definitely correct but is it the oldest operating port which was constructed by british east india company again there is a doubt in our mind so it can be either option b or option d the correct answer is option d and uh, take this uh, question as an example of to learn more about the Kolkata port. We will go for the explanation. The answer is D. The statement 1 is correct because it is the oldest operating port in India and was constructed by the British East India Company. And the Kolkata port is the only river and major port in India situated 232 kilometers upstream from the sand hills. That is it is from the near from the beach it is located nearly 232 kilometers upstream. Its navigational channel is one of the longest in the world. <laughs> And the statement 3 is correct because the port which was once considered the most important port in the country still remains the premier port which has been rightly called the gateway to eastern India. So all the statements are correct. Please remember that. We will go for the next question. Consider the following statements about the periodic labor force survey or the PLFS annual report of July 2018 to June 2019. It is released by the Ministry of Labor and Employment. It uses worker population ratio, labor force participation rate, unemployment rate as key employment and unemployment indicators. It highlighted that women's unemployment rate has increased enormously. Select the correct answer using the given below code. Option A, 1 and 2 only. Option B, 2 only. Option C, 1 and 3 only. Option D, all of the above. So, looking at this, the first statement seems correct because it's the Ministry of Labor and Employment. Second statement also seems correct because it looks at all this. The third statement seems to be a problematic because it has said it has increased enormously. Enormously seems to be a very drastic change we have been saying. So keeping that in mind, we can put a bit of doubt on it. So if you remove that, you are left with options A, 1 and 2 only, option B, 2 only. Second statement automatically becomes correct. Then the question is, it is released by the Ministry of Labor and Employment. Yes, it is quite possible because it deals with labor force. At the same time, this is a survey. And there is an organization in India known as the National Statistics Survey Organization. It could be that which is also doing it. So, if you, as you know, as you, you know, I was saying earlier, as you learn about the syllabus, as you learn about the different organization in India and what are the roles they perform in, you will understand that many things which have the word survey in them is related to the National Statistical Survey Organization, NSSO or the Central Statistics Office, CSO. So, again, there must be a sense of doubt in your mind whether it is the Ministry of Labor and Employment which is dealing with the PLFS or the survey office. The correct answer is actually it's the survey department. So you can say that the correct answer is option B. We'll go for the explanation and identify which department is looking into this. The answer is B. The statement 1 is not correct because the India's unemployment rate improved from 45 year high of 6.1 in the 2017-18 to 5.8 percentage in 2018-19 says the latest PLFS released by National Statistical Office, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. Uh, it is not the Ministry of Labor and Employment, rather it is the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation under which the National Statistical Office has released this information. The statement 2 is correct because the objectives of PLF, PLFS is to estimate the key employment and un unemployment indicators in the short time interval of 3 months for the urban areas only in the current weekly status. What are the 3 indicators? Worker population ratio, labor force participation rate, unemployment rate. And to, the second objective is to employ, estimate employment and unemployment indicators in both usual status, PS plus SS and CWS in both rural and urban areas annually. The third statement is not correct because it shows that the, there came a dip across all categories, though women and rural workers showed the most improvement. Women's employment, unemployment actually fell from 5.7 to 5.2 percentage and male employment fell from 6.2 percentage to 6. Urban unemployment was still at a high of 7.7 percentage in 2018 to 19, where there was a drop from 7.8 percentage in, so it was, it came to 7.7, .7, earlier it was 7.8 in 2017-18, while rural unemployment fell from 5.3 to 5 percentage. So it is not necessary that you must listen to the data, you must by heart the, all the data and the figures which are mentioned in this explanation, but you must have an idea that unemployment has fallen from 2017-18 data to 2018-19 data. It was released by the National Statistical Office under the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. It is not the Ministry of Labor and uh, Employment. So that is the you know explanation. That is the idea you must get from this question. 
we'll go for the next question consider the following statements about the national green tribunal statement 1 the tribunal's orders are binding Statement 2, any person seeking relief and compensation for the environmental damage involving subjects in the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 can approach the tribunal. The tribunal has no powers to review its own decision. Only Supreme Court can do this. Which of the above mentioned statements are correct? Option A, 1 only. Option B, 2 and 3 only. Option C, 1 and 3 only. And option D, all of the above. First statement, the tribunal's orders are binding. Yes, it is a tribunal. It has been given the power of a civil court. So, keeping that in mind, the first statement is true, the civil, the tribunal's orders are binding. So, one is correct. Keeping that in mind, you can eliminate option B, 2 and 3 can be eliminated. Second statement, any person seeking relief and compensation for environmental damage involving subjects in the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 can approach the tribunal. Many acts come under the NGT, the National Green Tribunal, but very clearly it is mentioned that the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 does not come under the tribunal. Please remember that the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 does not come under the NGT. Keeping this in mind, you can eliminate second option. What is left? You are left with option A, 1 only, option C, 1 and 3 only. 3, the th tribunal has no powers to review its own decisions. Only Supreme Court can do this. No, the National Green Tribunal has the power to review its own decisions. It's not only, only the Supreme Court which can do this. Those, the third statement is also wrong. First statement is correct. So, we can go for option A, 1 only. We will go for the explanation. <laughs> The answer is A, statement 1 is correct because the tribunal is tasked with providing effective and expeditious remedy in cases relating to environmental protection, conservation of forest and other natural resources and enforcement of any legal right relating to environment. The tribunal orders are binding and it has the power to grant relief in the form of compensation and damages to affected persons. The tribunal's orders are enforceable as per the powers vested are the same as in a civil court under the Code of Civil Procedure of 1908. The second statement is not correct because any person seeking relief and compensation for environmental damage involving subjects in the legislations mentioned in Schedule 1 of the NGT Act 2010 may approach the tribunal. What are the legislations mentioned in Schedule 1 of the NGT Act? The Water Act of 1974, the Water Cess Act of 1977, the Forest Conservation Act of 1980, the Air Act of 1981, the Environmental Protection Act of 1986, the Public Liability Insurance Act of 1991 and the Biological Diversity Act of 2002. Please note that the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 is not under the ages of the NGT. Look at the list again. You will notice that the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 is not under the ages of the NGT. The statement 3 is not correct. The tribunal has the power to review its own decisions. If this fails, the decision can be challenged before the Supreme Court within 90 days. That is the explanation for this. We will go for the next question. In context of Asian elephants, consider the following statements. India is the natural home of the largest population of Asian elephants. Second statement, it is listed in Appendix 1 of the CI Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora are also known as sites and Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Recently, they have been included in the Appendix 1 of the UN Convention on Migratory Species. Choose the correct code, Option A, 1 only, Option B, 2 and 3 only, Option C, 1 and 2 only, and Option D, all of the above. So, First statement, India is the natural home of the largest population of Asian elephants. Yes, it is quite possible. India is a very large country. India does have a large Asian population, Asian elephant population. So, the first statement is right. If you keep the first statement as right, second option gets eliminated, two and three gets eliminated. It is listed in Appendix 1 of the sites and Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Yes, that is also absolutely right. So, the second statement also gets correct. So, option A gets eliminated. Then the only thing left is option C, one and two only and option D, all of the above. Now, the question is on the third statement. Recently, they have been included in Appendix 1 of the UN Convention on Migratory Species. Elephants do migrate. It is quite possible that they can migrate between countries, especially since India, India has borders with, you know, Bhutan, Nepal and Bangladesh. It is quite possible that there is a migratory pattern where elephants do migrate to these countries. So, it is, that is a large possibility that it can be included in the Appendix 1 of the UN, UN Convention on Migratory Species. Keeping that in mind, I would rather go for Option D, all of the above. We will go for the explanation, just check it. The answer is D. Statement 1 is correct because India is the largest, is the natural home of the largest population of Asian elephants. It is found in Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan and Myanmar. The statement 2 is correct because it is listed as endangered on the IUCN red list. It is also listed in Appendix 1 of Sites and Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. The statement 3 is correct because the Great Indian Bustard, the Asian Elephant and the Bengal Florican have been included in Appendix 1 of the UN Convention on Migratory Species. At the 13th COP to the CMS in Gandhinagar, which was held in Gandhinagar, Gujarat. 
India's proposal to include all three species in the Appendix 1 was unanimously uh, uh, approved, accepted by the 13 COP to the CMS. And a migratory species may be listed in Appendix 1, provided that the best scientific evidence available indicates that the species is endangered. That is also a criteria for that. We will go for the next, uh, we'll go for the next question. The Global Economics Prospect Report is released by which of the following organization? A. IMF, B. World Economic Forum, C. World Bank, D. United Nations. Global Economic Prospects. Now, UPSC has a, a trend of asking various reports and asking which organization or which communities, uh, which body is releasing this report. Keeping this in mind, uh, generally aspirants have been learning about the major organizations and the reports which they are releasing. And because UPSC has always been, you know, asking one or two questions based upon this kind of trend. Keeping this in mind, Global Economic Prospects is a very important report which is published by World Bank. There have been previous year questions based upon this. So, we, without any delay, we will just go for the explanation. Just learn and listen about this. Answer is C. The World Bank released its Global Economic Prospects June 2020 report and the current estimates show that 60 million people could be pushed into extreme poverty by 2020 and the estimates are likely to rise further. This, is, this was the recent report given in the Global Economics Prospect released by the World Bank. We'll go for the next question. Recently, the government has launched the TULIP program for providing fresh graduates experiential learning opportunities in the urban sector, providing compensation to internally displaced people, conserving the indigenous variety of TULIP plants, providing financial aids for developing drugs for rare, rare diseases. Again, the word TULIP is there, the option C, conserving the indigenous variety of tulip plants is also there. Generally, we could make a connection, just go for it. But again, like I said, ABCD questions are one of the most difficult questions to tackle. It's a bit hard for us to go for it. At the same time, we need to go for it in certain cases. Such questions, please, please ensure that you are very, very clear about the topic before taking it. Or in the worst case scenario, just go for what your instinct says. Uh, this question is very hard for us to attend. But if you are read your current affairs, you will definitely know that it, it talks about option A, providing fresh graduates experiential learning opportunities in the urban sector. We will go for the explanation. The answer is A, Shri Ramesh Pukhriyal Nishank, Minister HRD, Shri Hardi Pespuri, Minister of State Independent Charge of Housing and Urban Affairs and All India Council for Technical Education, AICT, have jointly launched an online portal for the urban learning internship program known as the TULIP a program for providing internship opportunities for fresh graduates in all urban local bodies and smart cities across the country. And TULIP is a program for providing fresh graduates experiential learning opportunities in the urban sector. That was the question, that was the statement given in the question. And what is the purpose of TULIP? It would help enhance the value to market of India's graduates and help create a potential talent pool in diverse fields like urban planning, transport, engineering, environment, municipal finance, etc. Thus, not only catalyzing the creation of prospective city managers, but also talented private NGO and non-government sector professionals. And the TULIP program would benefit urban local bodies and smart cities very, very immensely. That is the idea. We will go for the next question. Consider the following statements about the Sundarbans. It is the world's only mangrove tiger, tiger habitat. It is a mangrove area in the delta formed by the confluence of the Ganges, Brahmaputra and the Meghna rivers in the Bay of Bengal. It is inscribed in the UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is not a Ramsar site. Can select the correct answer using the given below code. Option A, 1, 3 and 4. Option B, 2, 3 and 4. Option C, 1, 2 and 3. And option D, all of the above. First statement, it is the world's only mangrove tiger habitat. Yes, that is true. Please remember, even though the keyword only is that, the Sundarbans is the only mangrove forest which has tigers living inside them. So, the first statement is absolutely correct. Looking at that, option B can be eliminated. Then, if you look at that 1, 3 and 4, option C, 1, 2 and 3, option D, all of the above. The third statement is also become, becomes automatically correct because the statement 3 is also present in all three options. It is a mangrove, then you have to look at the second statement and the third, fourth statement. It is a mangrove area in the delta formed by confluence of Ganges, Brahmaputra and Meghna rivers in the Bay of Bengal. If you learn about your geography, you will understand that yes, the Sundarbans is present in the confluence of the Ganges, Brahmaputra and the Meghna rivers, which is near to the Bay of, Be near the Bay of Bengal. So, keeping that in mind, the second statement is also correct. Fourth statement brings us into conflict because now it is between C and D. It is not a Ramsar site. That is the statement given in the question. Ramsar convention, we have Earlier, we have discussed certain questions with regards to Ramsa Convention. Ramsa Convention looks at wetland conservation. And Sundarbans is one of the world's most important wetlands. And definitely, it is a Ramsar site. Even if you don't know it, just know that it is a Ramsar site. 
you will be learning more about your Ramsar site and what is the Ramsar convention as part of your environmental syllabus. <laughs> We will go for the explanation. The correct answer is option C because the Sundarbans is a Ramsar site. Go for the explanation. Answer C. Statement 1 is correct. Discovery India and World Wildlife Fund India have partnered with the government of West Bengal and local communities in Sundarban to help save the world's only mangrove tiger habitat. The statement 2 is correct because the Sundarbans is a mangrove area and the delta formed by the confluence of the Ganges, Brahmaputra and the Meghna rivers in the way of Bengal. The Sundarbans, the third statement, the Sundarbans are the forest of Sundar, Sundari trees are one of the largest remaining areas of mangroves in the world. The site also has exceptional biodiversity, notably about 400 Bengal tigers. Its ever-changing landscape is shaped by tidal shifts, rivers and creeks. The Indian part of the Sundarbans area is a separate wild, wild uh, world heritage site under the name of Sundarbans National Park. So understand that the Indian part of the Sundarbans is a world heritage site under the UNESCO. The statement 4 is not correct because it is located on the southwestern part of the delta. The Indian Sundarbans constitutes over 60% of the country's total mangrove forest area. It is the 27th Ramsa site in India with an area of 4,23,000 hectares and it is now the largest protected wetland in the country. Understand, it is a Ramsa site. We will go for the next question. Question number 22. Consider the following statements about LIDAR, light detection and ranging. It is a remote sensing method that uses light in the form of pulsed laser to measure distances to the object. Second statement, it is mostly used for ground-based surveys. Third, it can perform well in fog, rain, snow and dusty weather. So which of the above mentioned statements are correct? Option A, 1 and 2 only. Option B, 2 and 3 only. Option C, 1 and 3 only. Option D, all of the above. So it talks about a new technology known as LIDAR, which is light detection and ranging. And the first statement just gives the method through which this works. It says that it's a remote sensing method that uses light in the form of a pulsed laser to measure distances to the subject. Yes, it is quite possible because it talks about light detection and ranging and this could be the method that is employed. First statement sounds very reasonable. Second statement, it is mostly used for ground-based surveys. Yes, it can be quite possible. The third statement brings a bit of confusion because it says it can perform well in fog, rain, snow and dusty weather. It is very clearly known that uh, as a, if you are a person who's been traveling on the road for, a, you know, at least once or twice in very bad weather, you will understand that it does not matter if there is uh, high power lights or whatever because in fog or in snow or in dusty weather it's very hard for the light to penetrate and to show what is there on the other side and this is one of the major cause of road accidents so using that logic to say that it can perform well actually in fog rain snow and dusty weather seems a bit irregular so you can eliminate option three because it does not seem really relevant you are left with option a one and two only we'll go for the explanation the answer is a Statement 1 is correct because it is basically a remote sensing method that uses light in the form of a pulse laser to measure distances to the subject. Statement 2 is correct because this technology is mostly used for ground based surveys. The statement 3 is not correct because the radar can measure the distance to surrounding objects up to 5 meters away but won't fare well in identifying objects in the vicinity. Also, it can perform well in fog, rain, snow and dusty weather. That is the logic we must use. Even if you do not know the question, just think generally you will be able to uh, attend answers and identify uh, weak points in the question from which you can obtain the correct answer. Go for the next question. In the context of integrated check post Petra poll, consider the following statements. It is uh, India's largest land port located in the state of Maharashtra. It is the largest land custom station in Asia. Choose the correct code. Option A, one only. Option B, two only. Option C, both one and two. Option D, none of the above. So, it is the largest land port located in the state of Maharashtra, largest land custom station in Asia. Two statement question, a bit hard. Understand that uh, integrated check post Petra pole is not located in Maharashtra, rather it is located in West Bengal with regards to India-Bangladesh trade. And it is the largest land custom station in Asia. So, the second, second statement is right, whereas the first statement is wrong. So, keeping that in mind, option B seems to be the correct answer. We will go for the explanation. The ICP Petra pole is located at about 80 kilometers from the state capital of Kolkata the state of West Bengal on the India-Bangladesh border. Binapol is the corresponding place in, place in Bangladesh. The second statement is correct because it is the largest land port in Asia. Petrapol border is the only land port in South Bengal. It is also the largest land custom station in Asia. The land port alone accounts for nearly 60% of the bilateral trade between India and Bangladesh. So that is the explanation. Just remember Petrapol is the largest uh, custom land port in India, uh, land port in Asia. And it is located in the state of West Bengal and it focuses upon the trade between India and Bangladesh. Go for the next question. In the context of Payment Infrastructure Development Fund, consider the following statements. 
it will encourage deployment of point of sale pos infrastructure both physical and digital modes in tier 3 to tier 6 centers as also in northeastern states the setting up of this fund is in line with the recommendations of the bimal jalan committee it is fully funded by the government of india which is the correct code option a one only option b two and three only option c one and two only option d all of the above so this is talking about the payment infrastructure development fund it's a highly specific question and uh, you can definitely say that the first statement is right because it the second first statement also deals with payments infrastructure and how you can develop them the second statement we are not very sure whether it's the bimal jalan committee or some other committee the third statement it is fully funded by the government of india again like i said the retail payments while the government can be involved in it to be to say that is completely funded by the government of india without any influence of other banks and everything seems highly irregular so we can eliminate option three if you eliminate option three you are left with option a and c one and one and two only now the question is in option two the setting up of this fund is in line with the recommendations of the bimal jalan committee we are not sure it could be the bimal jalan committee or it could be some other committee so unless one has a very clear cut idea of what are the committees set up by the rba and what is their expressive function it's going to be really hard for us to tackle this question please understand it's not the bimal jalan committee it is the nandan ilekani committee as you learn about your rba as you learn about more about the economic syllabus you will be understanding the various committees and what they have performed so we'll go for the explanation the answer is a statement one is correct because the rba has announced the creation of a rupees 500 crore payment infrastructure development fund pidf to encourage acquirers to deploy pos infrastructure both physical and digital modes in tier 3 to tier 6 centers as also in northeastern states but the statement 2 is not correct because the the pidf will be governed through an advisory council and managed and administered by the rba the setting up of this fund is in line with the recommendations of the report of committee on deepening of digital payments chaired by nandan nilekani the statement 3 is not correct because the central bank will ship in with a contribution of rupees 250 crore while the remaining contribution will come from card issuing banks and are also card networks operating in the country the pidf will also receive recurring contributions to cover operational expenses from the banks and card networks the rba will also contribute uh, yearly shortfalls if necessary so please understand it is not fully funded by the government of india rather rba will be giving 250 crore the rest will be given by the you know card issuing banks and the other card operating uh, networks in the country they will be the ones who will be involved in the pidf and the first statement is correct the second statement is not the bimal jalan committee rather it is the nandan nilekani committee please keep that in mind we'll go for the next question recently india has signed a historic agreement called the mutual logistic support agreement or mlsa to allow access to military bases for logistic support with which of the following country option a australia option b canada option c bangladesh option d south korea so again it's an abcd type of question very hard for us to handle unless one has a very clear cut idea of what are the agreements india has recently signed it's going to be very hard for us to go for something keep this in mind read your current affairs if you see something where india has signed some agreement with a specific country mark it down locate it in the map see if there is any other correlation with it so i'd like you to say that the mutual logistic support agreement has been signed with australia so recently india has signed that that is why it was there in the current affairs and that is what we are going to be learning about in the explanation the correct answer is option a india and australia have signed a historic agreement called the mutual logistic support agreement to allow access to military bases for logistical support this was uh, agreed upon at the first ever virtual bilateral summit between the indian pm sri narendra modi and his australian counterpart mr scott morrison the agreement will facilitate reciprocal access to military logistics facilities allow more complex joint military exercise and improve interoperability between the security forces of the two nations it allows reciprocal access to military facilities in terms of logistic support which generally include food water petroleum and spare parts and other components the agreement will be useful during joint military exercises peacekeeping operations humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations scheduled deployments of military platforms and any other exigent situations that may arise so that is all for this video my name is cb joy signing off thank you